Jason MK. I think I remember you espousing a monarchist point of view. Do I think the U.S. should be a monarchy? Well, I have a, a video talking about the idea of the state and its relationship to society writ large in uh, scripture and tradition. Um, but to answer your question, um, do I think the U.S. should be a monarchy? Well, in principle, if it is true that monarchy is the divine model of legitimate statehood or the best model of legitimate statehood, then yes. But also, I would add to that that to speak of the existence of the state is not to speak of something other than the way you think society writ large should be structured. In other words, it's not that you have you know, a civilization or a society over here, and then you superimpose or bolt onto that a particular model of government. It is rather that the state is a kind of integrative principle, which is the focal point uniting a nation together as a single organism in practice, as well as in theory. So when we look at the transformation of the kingdom of Israel from the form it had during the period of the judges to the form it had during the rise of the kingdom of David. Um, it is not a mere transformation at the top. Instead, what's going on is during the period of the judges, because in large part of the cultic laws that were given at the central sanctuary in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, because of the fact that Israelites from all 12 tribes were required to make a pilgrimage to the central sanctuary three times every year. Not everyone did that, but enough did that so that it started to stitch them together into a cohesive, united organism. And being a cohesive, united organism, culturally, socially, is manifested in the presence of a single head of state. And this is the theology of the book of Deuteronomy. As a people develops towards maturity, they become more distinctly themselves, they become more uh, distinctly personal, but they also become more um, uh, fully and intimately united, more fully and intimately one. That's what you see throughout Deuteronomy. Okay, so Exodus, the first giving of the law, represents the beginning. Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law, represents eschatological development, glorification. Okay, so it's about multiplication. It's about the next generation. Uh, 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 Israel has started out um, uh, in Exodus, and then during the 40 years, they have had 40 years for the law to work its way into their bones and blood and into the bones and blood of the next uh, generation. So it represents their glorified, mature, multiplied uh, state. And there are many different ways you can see that. But you see at the beginning, you've got here, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one or the Lord alone. And then you have a commandment for one sanctuary, because the one sanctuary, which is central to it's the place to which all Israel gathers in its liturgical worship and in its memory of the events of the Exodus, which gave them birth. And remember, it's of becoming one mind, which creates Israel as a single organism. And consequently, you have in the very same book, the uh, uh, permission to have a single king who will uh, function as the unitive principle of the entire society. But what you understand when you understand that the king is uh, intended to be the unitive principle of the entire society is that he functions that way, not alone, not in himself, but as the head of an organization or an institution, which is the royal family. In other words, families that are stitched together in a relationship that includes both genealogical birth, but also relationships of uh, mutual uh, charity and covenant and partnership. It is those families which give the society a structure which persists beyond the um, uh, events of any given generation. So, you know, you take a society which does not have um, a webbed structure like this, and there's nothing in one generation which is going to preserve and perpetuate that concrete form down to uh, the next 
generation. Um, so the royal family exists as the unit of principle for this whole uh, web of families. So if you actually look at um, in the period of the judges, look at what happens to Israel. Uh, there are little bits of land that they never conquer. And those little bits of land are actually borderlands between uh, the territory of the 10 tribes and the territory of Judah and Benjamin. And what that does is it inhibits the development of a national consciousness in Israel, which means you have the complaint about the throne of David, which is a complaint that um, he is preferring his own house, the house of Judah, to these other Israelite houses. And that ultimately leads to schism in the kingdom. It ultimately leads to the separation of the Northern kingdom and the Southern kingdom. And what that tells us, spiritually speaking, is that disobedience to God's commandments, even in little details, if we consider that unimportant and we, if we allow what we might think of as venial sins to persist and we don't care, they will, down the road, start to develop an increase into mortal sins, into sins which will uh, rupture the relationship that we have with God. So to return to the main question, should the United States be a monarchy? In principle, yes, but that does not mean taking the current executive branch and just turning it into a monarchy as if it's something which can be accomplished from the top down. What it looks like is a restructuring of society as a whole. And that is something which cannot happen from the top down. Here is the way that you will have a society which manifests the charity which God gives us by commandment through the Holy Spirit. It begins with a relationship of charity with those who are immediately present to you, with your neighbors. Because it, imagine if everybody truly sought to exist in charity relative to others, what that would actually concretely mean. What that would concretely mean is that threads began to would begin to stretch out from one household and wrap itself together with another household. It would create the opportunity for marriages between the children of one family and the children of another family. That would tie together the fate and the destiny of these two families. And if family, not just as a nuclear institution, but in its extended form, if families were something that existed beyond one generation that unfolds and kind of multiplies outwards into a more united society as a whole. So C.S. Lewis in, uh, I think it's Great Divorce, he says, redeemed humanity is still young. It has hardly come to its full strength. It is like when you throw a pebble in the water and it ripples outwards in concentric circles. So do I think that monarchy is the ideal form of the state in the most technical sense of that word? Does it, is it the most perfect replica of the idea of the state which exists in the mind of God? Yes. But I do not think that you can have one that's just kind of imposed from the top down. It's something which really does have to emerge from the bottom up. And some people say, well, that's idealistic. Well, in a sense it is, you know, it is idealistic, but that doesn't equate to do unrealistic unless you think that ideas don't really exist, unless you're what the fancy people call a nominalist. Okay, so that's my answer question. I do have some articles on this. I have articles on 1 Samuel 8, the only text anti-monarchists use to make their argument because it's the only text they possibly could use. And the answer to this is quite simple. It's that Israel was not supposed to ask for a king until they had conquered all the land that God had appointed them to conquer. But what did they say? They say, let's have a king so that he can fight our battles for us, which is something they were supposed to trust the Lord to do. Um, uh, and in fact, it is their failure to conquer the land, which ends up splitting the kingdom into two, which is why God didn't want them to have a king until they had first followed the precondition uh, for doing so. Uh, and the warning is not about a king. It is about the king who will rule over you. It's about the specific king that's going to result by them trying to have a king before their time to have a king is present. Okay. Um, now... Sira International. By the way, I will be on uh, 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 that channel, Sira 